You know what really inked it for me in thinking or finding that the KEF R3 Meta are an amazing loudspeaker is when I was listening to the Chemical Brothers last week, or rather I wasn't listening to it, I was playing it in here, the new album, and I was making coffee in the kitchen. And the track Live Again was sort of midway through. And just as I was doing the pour over on the coffee, the sound of the bass was just, I just thought, what, what the hell, I'd never heard such sort of definition and texture from that track from the loudspeakers that I'd had in the previous week. So I just kind of had to come back in here and sit down and hear it in close quarters. This episode is brought to you by Blue Sound, makers of the Node X network streamer. Click the link in the show notes for more information. Welcome back everybody. Yes, regular viewers will know that I spent several weeks with the R3 Meta when I was last in Portugal. And even back then, even actually at the first listen, it was easy to tell that the R3 Meta were convincingly better than the LS50 Meta, as well they should be because they're more expensive. Now I sold my LS50 Meta, I think, well over a year ago to make space in my storage area. So yes, I'm effectively drawing on audio memory, long-term audio memory, and I know audio memory is absolutely lousy for things like amplifiers and DACs and streamers and phono stages and cartridges. And that's because the deltas, the differences between those components are generally pretty small. But I don't think that the delta between the R3 Meta from KEF and their LS50 Meta is a small delta at all. No way. But if you've heard both of them, the R3 Meta and the LS50 Meta side by side, then please let us know in the comments section below. Now I'm mentioning the LS50 Meta in this video because I've had extensive experience with it, I've covered it a lot, and I think it's a good reference point that many of you will have heard. Now from the get-go, we need to point out that both the R3 Meta and the LS50 Meta use the same one inch aluminum or aluminium dome tweeter. And that tweeter has the same metamaterial disc sitting behind it in both speakers. That metamaterial disc is designed to absorb most of the back wave of the tweeter so it doesn't fire forward again. But here comes the fundamental difference, is that in the LS50 Meta, the UniQ driver where the mid bass driver sits around the tweeter. That mid bass driver, you know, its name tells you what it does. It's designed to do mid range and bass. Whereas the R3 Meta has a dedicated six and a half inch, I think it's called an aluminium hybrid driver. And in this case, in the pair that you see behind me, that's sort of in blue, so it might not be so easy to see. It doesn't really pop out at you, but yeah, that's what does the bass inside the R3 Meta which then frees up the five inch driver that surrounds the tweeter, another aluminium driver, to just do mid range and mid range only. And those drivers inside the R3 Meta get to work in a taller and slightly deeper cabinet than they do in the LS50 Meta. And if I had to guess, and I really am guessing here, I'd say that the cabinet volume of the R3 Meta is probably almost twice that of the LS50 Meta, but I'm sure some of you will correct me if I'm wrong. By the way, the high gloss finish on these loudspeakers on the R3 Meta is very much, very much in line with their 2200 euro per pair price point. And I think they're really set off nicely by the matching, I think they're called S3 stands. They sell for 700 euros a pair. So for me, I don't really think the stands are optional. So. I would class these loudspeakers as a 3,000 euro pair of loudspeakers that include the stands.
One thing to note is that the R3 Meta are a nominally 4 ohm loudspeaker, so they could present a little bit of a tougher load maybe to some amplifiers than your average, I guess, yeah, it's typical that most loudspeakers are sort of 8 ohm nominal or maybe 6 ohm nominal, so 4 ohm nominal is a bit lower. However, sensitivity here is 87 dB, so they're not really sort of like amplifier ball breakers, they're just a little bit higher than your sort of 84, 85, 86 that you tend to see in most two-way stand mounts. I'm generalizing though, but I took no chances with my electronics choices. I went with the NAD M23 Eigentax power amplifier, which I've got to say I think is one of the best sounding amplifiers I've heard in the last five or six years. And I mated that with a PS Audio BHK signature preamplifier. And whenever I drop that PH, PH? Whenever I drop that PS Audio preamp into a hi-fi system, I'm always like, yeah, that just sounds fantastic. And on streaming duties, I have a Blue Sound Node X. But what really took my breath away when I set all of this up was my vinyl front end, which is a Torrens TD1500 turntable with a Torrens TAS1500 cartridge feeding into another PS Audio component, their Stellar Phono Stage. And I gotta say, I was playing, yeah, I've got it here actually, I pulled it out specially. I was playing the, I think the 2020 remaster of Jordan The Comeback, and <laughs> I was just blown away by the sound of everything, like the, the complete system. I just thought, wow, this is possibly the best sound I've had for what I remember to be years. I mean, it could have been that I was just in a good mood that day. It could have been, but what followed really kind of stayed true to that almost, yeah, that first impression. So I think the star of the show with the R3 Meta's sound quality is their seemingly unflappable nature. So when tasked with playing Brian Eno and Carl Hyde's High Life album, it becomes crystal clear, quite literally, that they're very good at maintaining composure when things get really complicated in the mix, especially in the mid-range. And in fact, that album's lead song, Return, is one of my go-to tracks for testing for early onset treble irritation. Because what I do is I put that track on, I turn up the volume and I ask myself, do I want to turn the volume down again pretty much straight away? Because sometimes with some speakers, we'll get to this in a moment, sometimes that track sounds like wire wall looks. Does that make sense? And with the R3 Meta from Kef, yes, I can turn up that track return and not want to turn the volume down because it sounds like wire wall. And I cannot say that about the Bowers and Wilkins 705 S3. I'm sorry, it's a great speaker, but it just, yeah, it just comes on as just too much in that lower treble region when playing that particular track. And I want to turn it down again. And so that brings us to our first side-by-side -side comparison, because I would say that the Kef put the treble on a much tighter leash than the Bowers and Wilkins to prevent, I think, unnecessary chafing. On the other hand, there is a benefit in some respects to having a more lit up treble in that player precision on the soundstage is more, yeah, I guess it's more specific, more precise with the Bowers. However, if we play something like Happy Monday's Wrote for Luck, the Think About the Future mix, which was I think was done by Paul Oakenfold in 1990, that just sounds more substantial through the Kef than the Bowers. And I'm not just talking about low-end substance and weight, I'm talking about the mid-range as well, because 
I have a bit of a guilty pleasure in that I love the song The Horse With No Name by America. Now there's pretty much no bass in that track, but the Kef give us more substance with vocals than do the 705 S3. And I'd say that the Bowers kind of lean more to a sort of candy floss presentation in that mid-range than do the Kef. And the only way I really know how to explain greater solidity in the mid-range from the Kef is if we imagine that sound is a tool which continuously shapes and sculpts the air as a chisel would wood, <laughs> wood, wood, then I think the Kef kind of cut deeper into the air than do the Bowers and Wilkins. And that's exemplified nicely by playing Wet Legs Chaise Long, where the Kef cut and carve the, I guess, yeah, the mid-range shapes deeper into the air than the Bowers and Wilkins, and to a lesser extent than the Zoo DWX, which sell for 2,500 euros a pair in the Supreme version, which I have, but they don't come with stands. Oh, and the Bowers sell for 3,000 euros a pair, no stands. But yeah, I've mentioned the Zoo, and that brings us to our next side-by-side -side comparison. Now, the R3 Meta aren't quite as microdynamically thrilling as the Zoo when playing the new Rebuke remix of And The Colour Red by Underworld. They're just not quite as zippy, not quite as snappy as the Zoo. But the Kef pack a bigger punch below the waist, so they better capture the physicality of a techno track like that than do the DWX. Moreover, the Kef come on as more composed when things get complicated than the Zoo, when dealing out tracks from the likes of Grandmaster Flash and the Sabres of Paradise. Sabres of Paradise, man, that album Haunted Dancehall is just mwah. It's just, it's so strange. It came out in the mid 90s. I think it was designed by Andy Weatherall to be like a typical, or to soundtrack a typical night out in London. But it doesn't sound how you would think it sounds. There's no doof in it at all. It's very, it's a very weird album. I recommend it. Go and, go and listen to it on, yeah, on streaming services or buy the CD. The vinyl's gonna cost you a stack actually because that's long out of print on Warp. Maybe they'll bring it back one day. And the Kef's composure is most noticeable when things get very dense in terms of layering of instrumentation in the upper mid-range, as it does on LCD sound systems, other voices, and built to spills going against your mind. And yet in separating the layers in the upper mid-range of those two tracks, the Kef just make it sound really just so effortless, certainly more effortless than the Zoo DWX. That's sometimes quite hard to say. And yet there is a downside to this because the Kef really do expose the poorer recording quality of that built to spill track. It just sounds, I don't know, just a bit flat. And it's a similar story with the Tinder Sticks' Curtains album, which when I played it through the R3 Meta, I think also yesterday, I'd never heard that album sound quite as murky as it did yesterday, and that can only be this sound system that I've got set up behind me. Sound system? Oh, this hi-fi system I have set up behind me. Yeah, I just never noticed how murky that, that recording sounded before, but it clearly does. <laughs> Now, how does the R3 Meta compare to another loudspeaker, particularly one that you're thinking of? Well, I'm really sorry, I can't tell you because I don't have that loudspeaker here right now. And one of the reasons for that is storage space. I only have a certain amount. I live in a sort of everyday apartment, so I don't wanna keep like very expensive loudspeakers in my cellar, so they have to stay in here, so I have to find space for them here. And I have room for about five or six different stand mounts at any given time. And those storage limitations are also why I tend to stay away, generally, but not always, but tend to stay away from floor standers because they require a lot more storage space in this apartment. And obviously the boxes are bigger, which then have to go into the cellar. My cellar's only so big as well. In fact, <laughs> this is a little known fact about Germany or certainly in my building is that every year my housemeister, so the guy that runs this building, he inspects my cellar to make sure that it's all organized properly and that I'm not storing boxes too close to the little sprinkler units, which for good reason, right? And I was told this week, as I was last year, yeah, I need to rearrange things, maybe even need to kind of clear out some things because 
Yeah, the pile of boxes is getting too high and too close to the sprinklers. I mean, can you imagine if I trip one of those off? Oh my goodness, that would just be a whole world of pain. But anyway, yeah, I got into hi-fi through stand mount loudspeakers. I think that's why I like them so much because I love the simplicity of a single box with two loudspeakers in them. Yes, I know you have to add stands, but that's generally only another box. And I tend not to keep the boxes for the stands. And my experience of living here in Berlin for the last five or six years and listening in this six meter by five meter room is that most of the, the stand mounts that I've tried, they're generally two ways and pretty much all of them, all of them require a subwoofer if I really want to sort of fill out the bottom octave in a bit. So if I want to go above 40 hertz, maybe into 50 hertz, whatever. So I'm generally thinking of the Wilson Audio Tune Tart, the Vivid Audio Kaya S12, the LS50 Meta from Kef, and yes, yeah, Sonus Faber that I've had. Yeah, the Bowers and Wilkins, which are over here right now. They need a subwoofer as far as I'm concerned. But the R3 Meta's top to bottom solidity means that they don't cry out for a subwoofer. That doesn't mean they won't benefit from one, and I will be investigating that down the line, maybe in a month or so. I might even add two subwoofers actually, because NAD are gonna send me the M66, which is the matching pre for the M23, and it's got room correction from Dirac, and I think proper bass integration for multiple subwoofers. So I'm gonna be investigating that down the line. So this won't be the last time that I talk about the R3 Meta in terms of low-end WOMP, but even out of the box, for me, there's plenty available for this space. I get just the right amount of room gain. And I think the R3 Meta generally roll off, maybe they're about 60 B down in the mid thirties, the mid thirties, hertz, mid 30 hertz. And that for me is perfect because just below that, so in the low thirties, I have a room mode, like it's mathematically baked in, I can't do anything about it unless I load loads of bass traps in here. And I mean loads, and I'm not doing it. So I think the KEF sounds so good in the low end here because they roll off just before my room gets triggered. Because as we know, the room in which speakers play can apply a glass ceiling to those loudspeakers' performance, which is why I had this room acoustically treated in everything but the low bass. And for me, I tend to prefer larger stand mounts in this room. The smaller ones, they need a sub. The larger ones that go a bit lower tend to fill out the room just nicely, but I think of all of the larger stand mounts that I've ever tried in this room, the R3 Meta are the closest to what I would call a bespoke fit for this room. It's a bit like having a, a tailor-made suit, right? It's just, it seems that the R3 Meta just fit this room just perfectly. I mean, perfectly is a strong word, but in a way that I just think, oh my goodness, I couldn't want for anything more. There's nothing that really bugs me. There's nothing that really stands out. And I would say this as well, like if you're going to audition the R3 Meta in a store, and I urge you to do so, don't be put off by their seemingly understated sound, especially in the mids above. Yes, you should hear that chunky solidity, but they're not flashy as the Bowers are. So I tend to find that speakers that aren't flashy in a demo are the ones that I enjoy in the long run. So the upshot of all of this is two things actually. I'm gonna be buying a pair of R3 Meta for this room. Not this blue pair, I'm gonna be buying a white pair. And the second thing is, is I'm gonna award the R3 Meta from Kef a Darko Knockout Award because they really are that good. Yeah, the R3 Meta are total winners. Anyway. If you like this video, if you found it informative or entertaining or a bit of both, then please consider giving us a like down below. If you like my attitude towards, I guess, slightly larger stand mount loudspeakers, slightly more expensive loudspeakers, or stand mount loudspeakers that is, because I have been doing a run of two to three K euros stand mounts in the last little while. I've got some more to come. In fact, I've got an even more expensive pair coming then yeah, if you dig all of that, then please consider subscribing to this channel. And as always, thank you ever so much for watching. Hello, me again. You're watching this video on YouTube, but if you are watching it over on my Patreon, you might be watching it a few hours early or even a few days early if I really have my shit together. And you'll also be seeing a whole bunch of bloopers where I stuff up majorly in this video 
at the end of the Patreon version of that video. So if you'll consider supporting me on Patreon, even if it's just for one month, just to buy me a cup of coffee or something, then that would be absolutely fantastic. So thank you very much.